All right, everybody, welcome to today's show. It is Wednesday, May 27th. Thank you for giving us some time to be your, I don't know. you doing hi everyone <laughs> so welcome at i've got more music still playing i'm still working that but yeah <laughs> so welcome to the show <laughs> welcome to the show gerald thanks for giving us uh your time this afternoon to to kind of dive into some of your work My and pleasure. the things that you do so why don't you tell everybody a little bit about who you are and just kind of you know, give me a brief background of the work that you do in you know especially in television you do a lot of television work but you've also done feature films in your career um, I started. I started off at Ryerson Polytechnical School, which was I had a film course back when I was a teenager, and then I uh, just started shooting other people's films, mostly because they had to make a project. So everybody figured out who was, you know, liked to shoot films and who didn't, who wanted to just direct. So then I shot a lot of people's films and liked it, and just kept going from there. So a long time ago. <laughs> sure. How did you how did you then make that transition in your professional career to getting involved in so much tel- high profile television work, especially? Um, I think it's just uh, persistence. You just have to survive uh, the times that you're not working, and you have to just keep your nose down and try and uh, don't give up. I think that's the the only way I did it. I think you just have to keep going. Makes a lot of sense. And you don't work. On- yeah, I mean, it's a lot busier now than it ever was sure. in television. Sure. There was a lot more uh, opportunity to do low-budget features back in uh, the 90s. And then they started to die out, I mean, about 10 years ago. Because the budgets were either really, really high or really, really low. Mm. So I think that's where we're at now in feature world. If you If you get offered a feature nowadays, it's probably pretty low budget or it's really totally high budget and then they get Roger Deakins to shoot <laughs> sure. or someone like, or someone like them. Sure. That makes sense. 250 million and up. They're not going to go for a guy who hasn't shot $200 million shows before. So right. I think it's different, bra- different brackets, but I started off low budget experimental films, music videos, documentaries. I've shot uh, every, everything that anybody asked me to shoot. I've tried to do my best. Even uh, four camera comedy shows, wax, but a right. whole other thing. Right. Well, today I think we we're going to talk about I think three of your last uh, pieces of work. You know, you did the first five seasons of uh, the television show Shit's Creek, which aired here in the United States on Pop TV. I believe it aired on CBC in Canada. Um, it's gaining popularity through Netflix and things like that. You had to jump off for the the last season, season six, to take on a project, uh, the fourth season of Van Helsing, which I believe was on CTA yeah. in, in Canada. And it's been on uh, Netflix and sci-fi here in the United States. And then going mm-hmm. back a couple of years to uh, the project Winona Earp, which is also on sci-fi and I believe on CTV in Canada. There's a lot of you know, different, <laughs> different yeah. networks that are carrying. Yeah. There's carrying different content. venues. Right. Yeah. Um, so why don't we go ahead and jump right into necessarily the first five seasons of, of Schitt's Creek, but talk to me a little bit about how that project came to be <clears throat> shooting with, uh, Eugene Levy and Catherine, Catherine O'Hara, and especially this is Eugene Levy's project. You know, his son, David, who also stars in the show, also co-wrote it with him. And it's a Canadian project. They're from Canada. You're from Canada. I assume that was a big part of it and getting involved in the project too. Mm, pretty much, yeah. I mean, I think uh, Dan had, uh, had had written a uh, pilot, and they'd shot a pilot in L.A., and then they shopped it around, and uh, they ended up coming to CBC, and then they got uh, approval to shoot it in Toronto. Gotcha. 
but it was uh yeah right from the start it was a great project though i mean it was uh eugene and dan were always talking about trying to keep it not just like a comedy lighting where it's like really bright and everything's lit so we it, it kind of evolved from trying to just have it like a one foot in reality type show where it's like it's a bit of a drama and it was uh, the comedy, but it wasn't like approached like a, just a basic comedy. I think they wanted it to have a, a as the seasons went on, they actually added more dramatic beats to it. Mm-hmm. And it became its own, it's, it, it, it came into its own probably in the second, third, fourth season gotcha. where they found out what worked and what didn't. And uh, But from my point of view as cinematographer, um, we just talked about, you know, how much we need to light it. The rooms we were shooting in were, you know, no windows. Mm-hmm. So the, you had to light and you had to shoot in a car. It's like, it was like a box, really, mm-hmm. the sets, because there was two tiny rooms, which you couldn't see out because it was, uh, you know, a studio out there. Right. And uh, so we, we just had to find the right amount of light so it wasn't too dramatic and then too serious and not funny, but funny enough that it looks like they could be real people. Right, like real enough that it, they could be real people and it could be a drama, but I think it's kind of it kind of worked uh, on that level and they they just went with the the drama part a little more and just made every all the drama funny too, which was <laughs> even uh, more more of the writers and uh, Eugene just finding out what worked and what didn't with all the characters that they, they that they created. Sure, yeah, because a lot of these sets, a lot of these, I read in an interview that you did with uh, the CB the CSC and a couple other places about, um, you know, the fact that you built a lot of these locations were sets. They were on a stage and the exteriors mm-hmm. were shot in a completely different area. Talk to me about, you know, you had mentioned in, I believe it was in the, it was an article in the, in the CBC, CBC, CSC magazine. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to keep messing that up in a location that you, that you had built on a stage you're not on location. It's a set mm-hmm. that you've built. And then you have to match the exterior for that same scene. But you're going to go on the practical location in, uh, you know, you don't know whether it's going to be sunny or it's going to be cloudy or overcast. How did you come back in your mind and kind of plan for that? Well, I had to think about that a little bit, but I, I went with the, uh, I just tried to pretend that we were going to have, like, there's nothing worse than lighting through two little windows and just making it cloudy out. So I went with, uh, let's hope that it's sunny. I, I just <laughs> went with it because then I could l- at least light the interiors with some sunlight or specular highlights coming in. Mm-hmm. So I really just said, I really just decided that I'm going to go for sunlight coming in the house or the, the different sets. And then when I get to the location, hopefully it's sunny. And if it's not, I can maybe put up a 5K or a 10K just to have a, add a little backlight or something to make it look like it might be sunny. Mm-hmm. Sure. But I definitely decided not to go cloudy on any of the scenes in, in case I got there. And then you'd have to shoot every scene twice pretty much. And well, we definitely weren't going to do that. It's hard enough getting through the day as it was. Right. Talk to me a little bit about seeing like uh, for this scene, this was one of my favorite uh, <laughs> favorites from the first seasons when they wake up there, you know, the, the premise of this show is that they, they're a family that was super rich and they now are down their luck and they've got to go to, you know, this look, this place is called Shit's Creek, which they somehow own this town because of a joke. And now they're living in the, mo- the only motel in the, uh, in the town and there's a water leak and everything is, um, yeah. just talk to me about when you had to make different changes like this, where it, you know, trying to find comedy, but not trying to make you look at the script, what things jump out at you of like, obviously that when you read the scripts as best I can. And, uh, you know, they're all different ages and uh, they're all together a lot because it's a it's a it's a ensemble and uh, try and make the actors look as best as possible. Because, sure. you know, they they do dress up a lot between Dan and uh, and Catherine uh, wearing different clothes and and Annie, the daughter. Mm-hmm. And they, there was all kinds of, uh, you know, high fashion stuff to do. So that had to look good. But mostly you're just trying to light for the, the story, the script. Right. I mean, it's 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 all it's all down there. I mean, you don't they don't want comedy, but like I said, it's like one foot in the end. A lot of shows were doing the same thing at the same time, where they weren't going for really like uh, curb your enthusiasm. Also, it's kind of mm-hmm. 
but that's the basic. For you, this you know, our audience is a different is a different level. There's people all all different levels. Talk to me about the advantages and maybe even some of the disadvantages of choosing to shoot on two cameras for a comedic show like this. Um, How much does it help you? Um, well, it, it was the the overs. So I mean, worked pretty good over the shoulder, and then I would put the other cameras. This one's on a tripod, but the last couple of one on the show. No, I didn't operate at all. I had two operators. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, Johnny Johnny Kalavec, yeah, and uh, Kalen McCullough. Well, I always had to say works to have him do any lighting through them through the up. It's a uh, you're doing a low budget for some money. You want to change the light. I didn't find the image, but I and there was almost like a doorway dolly where your operator is sitting on the doorway dolly, and it kind of felt like to me it was. A, I remember it was a shot going past. I believe I should have. I wish I could show video, but it was pe- going past the sign revealing the motel, and it was just kind of in that sense mm-hmm. of using the tools and the techniques that, you know, while still capturing that handheld feel to the shot and pushing it all forward. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing that really stuck out to me on this show was just how much involvement in the camera movement. It wasn't just for movement, especially as the seasons progressed. How did you start to develop that with them? You know, was that something right off the very first season, the first couple episodes, or was, or is that starting to get to know, you know, everyone, know the actors, and start to feel, and then, you know, as the seasons progress, it gets, it gets more and more. Common. But uh, I think you can't get a lot of movement. Two people talking to two boys in those hotel rooms, right, or more. But anyway, once we found what worked the best to get into the scenes that Dan and Eugene didn't want, it, then I think we we didn't have uh, the. And Kalen's also very good. Hand. You approached, you know, the plan to light these sets, light these scenes. You know, what you ever was in the common case of like yeah, embracing it. Was a, yes, the, yeah, I always try and keep a little bit of, uh, you know, I didn't want anything to go flat. So, I mean, uh, the challenge on the show really was not lighting the on the far side or, or whatever side worked best. But I did try to get a little bit of shape on it. Right. Because uh, it shadows, shadows are a little bit uh, less, and see what I could get away with. Because you know, it, it could have went darker easily, mm-hmm. but uh, I think they, they found uh, between Dan and Eugene and myself and the timer, uh, uh, Walt uh, at uh, Red Lab, we found quite a happy medium where it was kind of like maybe a drama, but it's definitely a comedy. Mm-hmm. Sure. So I think we, that's where we sort of wanted to stay. Station of the diner scene. You know, yeah. What kind of setup was this like for you as far as were you building out layers that were things that were always on and then you were coming in for things like for shots like this or for, you know, the shot of the character Bob here of, you know, you come in at the last second and you're kind of like, boom, boom. You know, now they're lit in this space or was it very much you've lit the space and then the actors are somewhat free to play in it? That's exactly what I did. I'd like the space I'd, with the act with the. Uh, with the stand-ins, I'd like the space to where I wanted it to be, where the sources were, because the the windows were unshootable on the outside. Like we had, uh, we had to have drapes and all kinds of, of uh, stuff between the windows and uh, the wall, so you couldn't see the stage. So we kind of stayed away from that area, and then I would use the sconces, even if it was daytime. I'd try and use the sconces mm-hmm. or the sconces off. And try and create a. Um, I always lit this, the area so that people could play. Like, I didn't want to, because of the comedy, once they start performing or thinking about being funny. So, I think uh, once we've been really bad, like a bad shadow, or. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, definitely, uh, definitely it was uh, set up so that I didn't have to do a lot once we start shooting. And I did do 80% of the light on the stand ins in a wide shot knowing that we were going to be moving in closer and closer and then at the end or nicer. Now, did that approach change? But I would definitely... I, no, go ahead. Uh, no, I think I, I think I stayed pretty much with that the whole time. It was to see the blocking. We'd have to figure out the blocking. And then with the directors who were on that show, there was quite a few directors. But the, the directors and Dan and Eugene and I would watch the blocking and then together we would all come up with the best way to shoot the... Uh, you know, operators, Dan, Eugene, mm-hmm. me, and the director would have different pitches. And then they would either be taken or not taken. And then we would figure it out together and then we'd have to shoot. But the blocking was important and it was a big part. We didn't want it to 
sort of be the same every time. Right. So you actually, so, so you actually did block light shoot like like we're supposed to. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely, definitely. And 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 another thing that people might not realize, every line was scripted. Oh wow. There was no improv, no improvisation unless it was something that uh, one of the actors came up with on the day, and then it would have to be approved by Dan or Eugene to to you know be used. But wow. for the most part, it was it was taken if it was funnier. As Eugene was about, is it funny or is it funnier? And then if it, it then that's it. That's all Eugene wanted to. Mm-hmm. I mean, he thought he 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 liked everything about the show. Right. But he was there. To- Obviously, there's what, what I found really interesting, and it makes sense hearing that it's scripted, just because knowing both he and Catherine O'Hara are, they just riff that the way it's shot, it like it lands on those beats perfectly. And it's like, okay, well obviously you're going to change the angle. You're going to set things up. And I'm like, I wonder if that was just Eugene just kind of came up with yeah. that. But that's kind of wild to think that it was that hit on the hit on the nose. It's something that they came up with beforehand, you know, writing all that out to come up with. That's, that's really cool. Yeah. But uh, Catherine O'Hara came up with her own things all the time. Really? She had, she had, script and she she would change things and do what she you know would bring ideas to the table that usually went ahead because they were so good so i mean it, it was uh i think anybody could have went and talked to Eugene about any of the lines mm-hmm. but Catherine o'hara definitely was the improvisational one on set and that she you know she nobody needs to tell her anything either right <laughs> about being funny so she 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 offered her own I mean, she wrote all those songs that she created. Um, Whether like, she wrote all those songs herself, the crow, mm-hmm. the crow bits, and all that, she did all that herself, and uh, then brought it to the table and had to read through. I think that's when the, they they got to hear what she had. Wow. Story had had in store for them. She would hear. They would hear it in the uh, read through. That's wild. Yeah, because her character, which they had, which were. Yeah, I say because her character is is a I believe she's an actress as well, like a kind of a washed up soap opera actress mm-hmm. who is down on her luck and trying to find some semblance in this small town and becomes a part of the town, you know, city council or town council, I guess you'd say, and stuff like that. And it's 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 a really funny show. It really is. Um, yeah, no, they 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 really were funny. Yeah, oh. I mean, it's still the, the sixth season just finished, mm-hmm. I think. Showing, right. I, did, I don't know if it showed uh, on pop. Yeah, I think, I think it's. I think it's over. I think it's. Sh- it did show. It just finished. It just finished on pop TV in the United States, but it hasn't made its way to Netflix yet. I think that that'll be coming in the next right, few okay. months. Yeah, and I think that's where it, it gained its okay. popularity here in the United States. Is that so many people hadn't seen? It. I know I hadn't seen it because I don't have cable TV. I just you know I'm streaming all that stuff, and then it, mm-hmm. that's when I re- I reached out to you and was like, this is this is amazing. This is wild. And what's really cool to me was through the first season through. I, was it the second season that you then joined the Canadian Society of Cinematographers after the this show as well? What was no, no, I, I, I was in. I've been in the CSE for twenty, okay, twenty five years. So they just, so I just did. It, they just didn't have. They just forgot to put the CSE. Ah, on. okay. Because I remember seeing that being like, <laughs> yeah. like I can I was like, wow. I was like, I'm, I'm amazed that he finally. You know, I was always in the impression that you had joined at that point, but that's wild. So what, no, no, yeah, but, yeah. I, I just forgot to. <laughs> I did get my CSC on aim in time. Yeah, gotcha. So it just went through a couple of years like that. I think the. Mm-hmm. One time I did put it on and they forgot to put it on, and then another time I forgot to put it on. So <laughs> that's fair. It happens. Yeah, that happens. I mean, that's, that's no big deal. Right. It happens. I mean, it, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about right, um, going into season four and what that process was like of just, I'm trying to pull up some different um, scenes here of just some different shots of, you know, we talked a little bit about the things didn't change that much for you, but what, did you change at all and how you approach some of the lighting? Cause you figure a few years has gone by at this point. So there's some new technology you've done other projects, you know, how did you walk into the sandbox and keep playing? Um, just to try to make the, keep things new, we'd use different lights. My uh, gaffer, Lorena Ruddick, who's fantastic, she uh, came up with a lot of like before the S60s came out. We lit the uh, the inside of the motel rooms with uh, basically uh, made uh, LED strips, mm-hmm. and they were bicolor. We had uh, daylight and uh, tungsten on them, and she built them herself. She built about thirty or forty of these light boxes with strips in them 
and we had those to light the interior after because usually I would use uh, big lights and, mm -hmm. and soften it down and just cut it up in those rooms. And uh, we had a few movable walls that I could get a light into the other room and then uh, put up a silk or something and have the light come through and get a nice key light th across the room or across the, uh, the stage area. Mm -hmm. So I think most, most of it, I just, uh, it changed and it evolved just to make it faster. And I, I, I picked the things that worked like, I had to have, like I was saying about not matching what might happen when we get to location mm -hmm. three months later, because I didn't want to, like, even if it was on the inside and it was cloudy on the outside, it's a lot easier to time, like in your color timing, it's a lot easier to color something that looks like it's sunny mm -hmm. out of a great day if you're cutting in between the interiors and it's sunny on the uh, inside. Right. You know what I mean? Like, it's, if sometimes you had to, and, but sometimes I would just put uh, hits on the wall that looked like the, maybe the light was coming through the window at a certain point, mm -hmm. even though it could never have come through there. What were you using to create those hits on the wall? Like do we see in this frame here? Um, what yeah, was your that's a Leco. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was just a tungsten Leco. Okay. And I did have some uh, daylight Leco's too. The, um, the Joe Leco's? Anyways, I had a couple of daylight Leco's. Couple, I had four... Tungsten Lecos, the Joe Lecos, yeah, the Joe Lecos. Mm -hmm. So I had quite a few Lecos through the place. I used uh, a lot of 5Ks coming through the front. There was a backdrop that I had to light that also had, uh, I think, 5Ks up in the ceiling hitting that. But yeah, there's a good example of just a hit on the wall mm -hmm. there that looks like it might be coming from that air conditioner window, but it's not. Right. Right. So I had to put those up, otherwise it just would have been dead. Like there was no, I couldn't make it look like it was sunny in there because the windows, if you got to see out, you wouldn't be able to, you'd see the studio. Right. So there wasn't a lot of trans lights. There was just a big one in the front of mm -hmm. the building. Okay. Now the trans lights worked fine. It was uh, across the street. Yep. Go ahead. I say, was this a situation too where you're using a trans light as well? This would have been in season four. Uh, nope, that's actually on location, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's on location, and that's the real town that we shot in. And that's where, uh, you know, we. if you look outside there, we there's a restaurant on the left we couldn't see, so we never saw over there. Mm -hmm. Bob's Garage is across the street, and the restaurant is across the kitty corner uh, side street. Okay. So that I use a lot of NDs on the window. That's mm -hmm. basically, that's basically was how I did that. I mean... Didn't want to have to burn out the windows because we were we were on location for so short a time. Right. I wanted to make as much use of the exteriors as I could to show it was a real a real town. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, something I I had uh, NDs. I think for this season we had NDs uh, on uh, plastic. So I think they were N9s, and then I would add an, an N6 or another N9 depending how sunny out sunny it was out. Gotcha. But it was just a balance, a balance thing. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna throw you in. Got a, to, you probably had to do that a hundred times. <laughs> yeah, I've been been, the, been there before, trying to make it. You know, it, it's funny how <laughs> well you can make it look, and then sometimes it's just like, God, that looks awful. And it, that's what, in watching the show, it was kind of the thing of it plays nicely when even people come in and open the door, and you can see in some of the clips that I've shared on the uh, the link attached is that you see. Uh, like Roland's wife walks in at some point, it starts to get a little brighter outside, but it it passes because a lot of places like that would have ha maybe had something on the windows already, you know, and a lot of you know a lot of restaurants or a lot of shops mm -hmm. or something like that. And so that's why when I'm watching it the first time, I'm like, I I, I want to believe that that's a real location, but at the same time, I'm like it could be on stage. I'm not sure, <laughs> you know, it's like because it looks so consistent throughout the show as well. And, yeah, you know, it's that's one thing that shooting you know on a, on a stage obviously you have that control you have that consistency you know how much did that change for shooting a sequence like that when you're in the rose apothecary at towards you know later half of the of the seasons of the show where you know you're gonna be that practical location but you've got all these other scenes to shoot and all this other stuff and you know where does that conversation become within you know the context mm -hmm. of how you're going to shoot it and keep that look as consistent as possible Hmm. It was a long question. Well, I think you just you just have to go into it, and you know, well, you just have to get into it, and, and uh, 
try and make it look as realistic as you can. I, I think that's the only uh, the only way to put it. You just have to judge on the day whether you're not whether it's looking real or not, or if it looks fake, or if it if it gels together. But uh, for the most part, I think the exteriors and interiors worked really well, and uh, yeah. I don't think it was, uh, I mean, it's just basic trying to match your interior and exteriors, right? Sure, sure. It makes sense. Um, I want to throw in a question that we've got from from some people watching of talking about the focal lengths that you used on the stage work and maybe just in general of, you know, where did you play inside of the focal lengths? You know, is there a specific thing in a in comedy for this that you try to shoot wider? Are you shooting longer lens? Are you shooting, you know, medium lenses? What comes to your mind when you when it jumps off the script? Me, me in the middle, yeah. In the middle, yeah. It was all in the middle. It was all 32, 50, 75, 100 for real close-ups across the room. But the locations were so small that I think we would probably be between 100 and 35. Mm-hmm. We'd we'd go wide for some some wide shots. We'd go 18, but uh, for the most part, it played right in the middle where you know, there was no distortion either side. Like there's nothing getting too uh, there's nothing too wide that's distorting, and there's nothing too long that's uh, you know getting rid of the background that you don't want to see, or because you really want to feel them inside their environment. So I we really just I think kept in the middle the middle end of their lenses. Thirty two is probably our most used lens. Twenty five, thirty two. Now was that I like a, the twenty nine now though? But yeah. The, was that 29 is a, a beautiful lens. Was that a part of picking the Cook S4s, you yeah. know, just given the focal lengths that are available? I've, I've changed a couple times now. I mean, I've been using the the, the, the Leicas. The, uh, they're all like the same size mm-hmm. and same weight all the way up to, I think, uh, 75. Mm-hmm. So I like those lenses the best now. They're smaller and a lot easier to handhold. Sure. And they're nice. they've are they got a nice soft uh, feel to them. Mm-hmm. Now, where did you have to diffuse it or anything? It's just got a nice bite to it without being right. Now, where did you play? I, I say, where did you play inside of this? Uh, is the sense of um, like from a, were you shooting wide open on these or were you shooting a little more stop down, even in the interiors to keep that you're know, obviously on a wider lens, but to keep it so you're not super shallow in your depth of field? Yeah, I tried to keep it around a two between two and two eight the whole time. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes if I found that I was doing a, a group shot, I would have to close it down a bit just so that everybody was in focus if they're if if they're if as prevalent in the frame or on the same the same plane. So I would try and uh, you know keep it around two two eight, so you can it's a little easier for pulling focus too. I didn't want to have everything wide open or mm-hmm. you know just make it. Uh, the backgrounds die and die out and stuff. I think it, it just it's better to feel like you can see the room across the uh, across the way, and you can uh, feel like they're in those environments. So I don't think you have to, you know, have shallow depth of field all the time just because it looks better. But right, because you know everybody knows everybody loves the way that looks. Sure, of course. But I think sometimes you have to you have to get more depth of field. So you can make it work with all the different ensemble of actors. Mm-hmm. You don't want to have somebody that's only a foot or something behind somebody to be out of focus if they're involved in the in the drama. Right. So I like I was pretty aware of that I'd go up to four or five six sometimes if I had to if it was a group shot. Mm-hmm. But uh, most for the most when you got the you know you're 25 or 32, mm-hmm. you need to have uh, something like a two or a two eight. Right. Talk to me a little bit about what it was like. But that's. Uh, As I talk, we talked to me a little no, bit ahead. about. Talk to me a little bit about uh, what it what it was like to get nominated for this show. You you received a nomination for, uh, through the the Academy in, uh, up in in Canada, and then you actually and you won for best comedy, best uh, photography in a comedy series. And uh, talk to me about what that was like. And was this? Yeah, that the, was great. Talk to me a little bit about that. Oh, it was great. No, it was really great to, to be uh, nominated, first of all. And and then to win was a real shock. I was uh, totally blown away. But, uh, yeah, it's great to win an award for some a great show. I mean, it was uh, a lot of fun. And Eugene and Dan were great, so they were really supportive. And 
put my name in for the award. So that's uh, I have to thank them for even uh, just putting it out there. Well, that's really which cool. Which is nice. Well, I didn't know that that's how how it got how it got to that point. That's really nice. Um, let's. I think I. I think, yeah, I think you have to the show a little bit in moving into. You jumped off of Shit's Creek to jump on to season four of another show. Um, that's a little bit different. <laughs> it's getting kind of back into that darker uh, drama area. Kind yes, of thing. that was great. Talk to me about Van Helsing and that project. You know, sci-fi yeah. here in the United States, CTV over in Canada, and what how like, that project came to be and how you got involved. Um, I just got a call from the producer, Mike Frislev, who's at Nomadic Pictures, and I, I knew him from uh, Ryerson days, and he's a pretty he's a really successful producer out in Alberta. He did uh, he's done all kinds of shows, but they're Nomadic films, and now he's in Vancouver, and they were doing Van Helsing, and they were on their third season I think and then in between seasons I got a call from Mike and said if I want to ask if I want to come out to Vancouver so I jumped on that and uh, it was a lot a great a great time and a lot of fun mm-hmm. and uh, yeah I got to work with new people it was uh, it's kind of hard going to another province and working with a whole new crew and everybody either did it last the year before or didn't do it yet so that was difficult, uh, getting to know all 60, 70 people in a week before you start shooting. <laughs> right. But it was great. Everybody was fantastic. Mm-hmm. And what's that process like for you coming onto something that already has somewhat of an established look, uh, look to a show versus you came in on the ground floor of a show like Shit's Creek where you're able to kind of develop that process with everyone and then continue that on? You know, what mm-hmm. were you coming into it? Were they saying, you know, we want to change the look of the show or was it continuing on from previous seasons? And what was your approach in that? And uh, I mean, basically, they had what they did, they, they, the producers and this this had a new showrunner this year. So the new showrunner was, uh, you know, had his own ideas about how the show was going to progress in the fourth season. And basically, I think the uh, it came down to the producers and the showrunner wanted to have more. Um, they wanted more handheld. They wanted more action because there is a lot of fighting in the show, and uh, the style for the first uh, three seasons, I think, was more. Uh, um, what what's the word? It wasn't as handheld. It wasn't as uh, action oriented. Mm-hmm as far as compared to the uh, fourth season. I think it was more stylized, and I think that it looked great, and it, and it was uh, fine. But I just think the new showrunner wanted to change things up and uh, make it more immediate. And I think the, uh, the stunt guys wanted to have more coverage in their fighting. So I think all that just culminated in the end of being uh, looking like it does now. Mm-hmm. And I tried some things that I always wanted to try with fight scenes that I'd done before that worked. And I also tried some different things, different shutters. And uh, I had a great operator on that show. And he had some interesting ideas about how to move the camera and he could uh, do anything with it. And, uh, yeah, yeah what Robin was... Lind- Lind- Lindala, his name was, Robin Lindala. What was your approach on? He was based in Vancouver, that? Robin, okay. and he's a great. Yep. I was, was going to say, what was your approach of working with him? And my approach for working yeah. with your camera operator, and especially in those well, fight I sequences. Well, I think uh, it was just. Um, I think he. There was two cameras. There was A and B camera, so a lot of times we double up on um, you know getting stuff shot. So. Sometimes we'd start a fight scene and then we would leave Martin Haas behind to finish it up because, you know, like uh, fight scenes can take hours out of your day. So we had to do some shuffling here and there. So we'd leave one camera behind to clean up some of the small bits after we got the acting done. And then we would come back and uh, start another scene with both cameras after he came back. But uh, for the most part, it was a real collaboration with everybody on that show because uh, everybody knew what we were trying to do. And there wasn't, uh, I think in a lot of uh, 
I mean, it's, it's not as huge a budget as uh, some shows, mm-hmm. but it, it actually like uh, they're saying like it just it punches above its weight as far as like the production value that we got on it. Mm-hmm. And for the uh, for the amount of time we spent on it, because we would shoot, uh, you know, 10 pages a day, sometimes seven pages, tons of action, tons of effects. But somehow we always got it done in 12, 13 hours. And uh, I think the results were good. Yeah. That's a great looking show and it definitely it's it's been interesting to see a little bit of the transgression between all the seasons and especially what you talked about now. You know, talk to me a little bit about how you find that balance within creating mood and creating tone in a show like this and mixing it in with the action and the high energy and things like that and while still being nimble and being fast. You're shooting ten pages a day, but it doesn't look like you had to shoot ten pages a day from the look. That you know, you never, it never appears that occasions, you know, how did those things, uh, what was the process that allowed you to maximize um, everything? All those things. I think you just have to be fast and you can't take, you can't take too long to do anything. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, otherwise it's going to wreck your last scene or you won't get through it. So I think you just have to spend the right amount of time on the scenes to get the look that you want. And, uh, I think, uh, for the most part, I don't think there was anything that, you know, some scenes probably could have had more, a little bit more coverage if we had more time. But for the most part, I think the directors were really working hard and they were really prepared. And then we just uh, made it happen. Mm-hmm. And Robin was uh, awesome for keeping things going because he's uh, just a powerhouse and uh, he can handhold all day and just keep going. <laughs> he's awesome. That's great. What was the camera package on this show? What was uh, was it something that you were able to bring in and change, or was it something that camera already, package? Already two, two. Uh, did we have? Oh yeah, we had one Alexa and one uh, Mini. I don't think we had two Minis at that. I had, uh, I, I had uh, Sumalux uh, Leica lenses because they're because we were using the Ronin a lot. Mm-hmm. I had in between taking uh, the lens off. I don't know if you've used a Ronin a lot, but if you yep. are switching lenses a lot, if it's going from a really heavy one to a lighter one, you've got a little more time to adjust. Whereas we were literally putting on lenses and being ready in a few seconds with the Ronin. Mm-hmm. And uh, that really made a difference. Now, I, I like, think up to 75, they're all about the same weight and the same size. Right. Now, I like to, I, I use the Ronin quite a bit, especially in commercial work, and I use it mostly like a hothead. You know, and just the sense of I can have it. It can it can get a quick shot here. It can go on a jib, that kind of stuff. How do you like to use it? How is that? How is working with the gimbal technology in a show like this come into play for you? Well, we had uh, um, we had a crane on set all the time, which was uh, was it called a? Uh, it belonged to Dean the the grip, key grip. Um, he had a, I think it was a 27 foot, uh, arrow crane. Mm-hmm. So it just was remote head. So we had the Ronin on that a lot. And then we would just take it off there. Uh, Robin had a whole system down so he could just pop it off the Ronin off the, the crane mm-hmm. and then pop it onto his handheld uh, unit. And he'd be, uh, he would be Ronin hand holding the Ronin just five, not even five minutes after taking it off the crane. Right. Right. So that became a real workhorse. We used the crane every, every day <laughs> for at least the wide shots or at least, you know, to get up off the ground. And because mm-hmm. that, that, this scene here was in a studio, that scene that you just showed. Let me go back to that. And it was supposed to be a uh, uh, clearing in the woods. So we, we'd start in the woods and uh, they end up in this place here, but this was all on, uh, on the stage. Mm-hmm. So it was, uh, worked out pretty good. What kind of challenges does it bring? But the Ronin, sh- I think, is a great, great piece. Sure. I say, what kind of challenges does it bring um, to I don't shoot think something I, like this? If you have, uh, the so, uh, Ronin or the I was going to say what, the show. I was going to say what kind of, in a in a location like this, what kind of challenges from from both camera and from lighting of shooting an exterior scene like this on a stage? What kind of challenges do you face in that that space? Uh, just matching again, that's the same thing. You're just trying to match, like you're trying to remember where you put your key 
or you wrote it down or you have it uh, listed somewhere in your notes and you remember where you had the key on the exterior, you might be doing the interior a week later or whatever, or two weeks later, it's just so you have those notes. And then after that, I think you can pretty much, uh, once you remember where your key was, you can uh, find it pretty fast and it'll all fit together once you start keeping the continuity of the lighting. Is there anything? And that, the, the actors also in this show were awesome. So, is there anything that you use on set that's kind of become your workflow of? Well, on that show, I didn't have a dit or a colorist on set, so I would just get my uh, lot that I worked out with the lab, and then we went from there. I didn't. Uh, I just had my monitors, and I didn't have any way of changing anything except on the. Uh, I had two or three lots. I didn't uh, didn't have too many, and uh, I just went from there. It's a lot easier though to keep in track of stuff when you have a somebody on set that's uh, you know can find a scene and show you what you did a month ago on a show. Mm-hmm. So I had a tip. I had a great dead on uh, DMT on uh, 100, which I just finished, mm-hmm. and that was uh, that made it a lot easier to keep track of things that were going to be needed to keep track of months later effects and because uh, we were jumping around a lot. So it was uh, a great to have uh, Jay Rego doing that for me as mm-hmm. DMT. That's great. Out in Vancouver. So I think, I think you have to keep track of it. I mean, I, I, I always rely on my eye for everything. So, I mean, all these changes that film's gone through and, that video's gone through, I think you still have to trust your eye and that's going to be your saving grace. If you can see it with your eye, then you're, you have something that's consistent. I think you can get fooled by technology a lot and uh, you can adjust things a lot, but I think you've really got to start with everything, whether it's film or uh, video, you have to start with your eye and find what you like and what, you know, contrast ratios, amount of light, color of light, and then from there you can get technical. But I think you are you have to use your eye because there's nothing faster and there's nothing you have to carry around. Sure. When you're on set, you just have to look at it. Is there ever any involvement? How do you find that uh, when you're when you're lighting? You know, you can rely inevitably right now, the tech and she and I, you're looking at what I was going for and then doing the same thing. Yeah. It's like the... Uh, I'm going to let you... Resp- I was going to... I did want to ask you that. I'm getting cultures working with editors and things like that. Is that ever Creek or any of the shows that you do? And- um, there is a... The, the cinematographer. I like talking to them about what... I mean, editors as possible because that's all the story. I mean, it's that whole argument with EP. It's like, I'm not going to be able to. So... You know, it's kind of risky without, I mean, I know a lot of directors, they'll say, oh, this is a one-er, and that log, or if they wanted to shorten the cinema tour thing was you. So I think directors that do a lot of television so that the editor's not going to call up and say, I, I, we have to, and I can't go into it. So you, you know that. Everybody knows that story. Right. <laughs> but I think uh, it's, just a, it's, it's, just a, it's just a matter of uh, getting the coverage. I like, I like editors coming to set. If they if they take it to heart and timer, visit them after things they like to to the to the she can talk to me about that was it was, and uh and uh just had fun doing it. It was a lot of fun that show. Mm-hmm. What were mostly because the actors and uh mm-hmm. the action was fun too. There was a lot of about your approach in how you were covering that action for you know, were you shooting multiple cameras and were you hiding lights and putting things in these were this 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 particular one was in uh, stage, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, I just tried to keep the camera and be lit so you can walk you can walk from a wide into a closer shot. And so uh, keeping the lights out of the frame is uh, pretty important on those action shows because you want to be able to move the camera around, and you want to be able to uh, you know lights practical. And if I did have uh, working film lights, I would try and keep them just out of sh- out of shot. Mm-hmm. I would hang them or put them around uh, corners and then I would have practical lights inside the room so I could uh, get away with seeing the ceiling, say, or sealing the floor. The right way without screwing this room here. <laughs> He's getting hung up by the ceiling, but just kind of coming through, you know, were you again kind of using a crane in this sense with uh, using with the room? On this show, I didn't use the Ronin at all. 
it was all uh, dolly and uh, handheld and conventional. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the Ronin, yeah, the Ronin, I don't think I had it at all on that. I think I started using the Ronin on the last, on the fifth season of uh, Schitt's Creek. Very, okay. very minor. And then I didn't read it. We had it on, we had it on the Ronin every day, which was really great. Gotcha. It's a little more, it's a little different than a steady cam, of course, but right. the remote part of it is fantastic. Right. Yeah. Just putting it on the dolly. Or, I mean, that's that's the new norm now, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Explorer. Right, right. What were some Pardon of the, you know, what did that, how did that interfere or did that help the show? Was that something that was kind of planned out of why you went to Calgary? Yeah, I think they like the wintertime look there. There was that, uh, there's a huge uh, farm there that has a lot of those that then help a uh, back lot on a thing ever since uh, Lonesome Dove. Could be wrong, but they did uh, a lot of, they've done a lot of shows there. The uh, the Fargo series, I think, it looked fantastic there. And we got, some, oh my gosh. It was uh, just, it's it was all great. It made it, it made it, you were running through the snow. It was, it was pretty great. I liked it. Now, talk to me a little bit about the production design in a in a sequence or in a show like this, where it's the show has all these different little elements of what was that process working with your production designer? Because I'm just by what's what's going on in the background there. Was that something that you guys kind of planned out together? Was it things that you talked about? How did you build out some of these these work? The designer on uh, Van Helsing was fantastic. She uh, had all kinds of ideas about color, texture. And uh, she would bring it to the table and she would talk to me about light and color and we would uh, collaborate on it and uh, come up with what we came up with color wise. She was, she was really fantastic. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it was just fun to see what they put together. I mean, this one, I think this is some kind of barn. I think we had to, yeah, this is a barn. So there's lots of slots, slats in the, in the in the walls, so just use that to bring some light through. We had to smoke it up on that one. We had the whole building covered with plastic to keep the smoke in because uh, it was just get it would just be dissipated too fast. But uh, it, it was uh, it was pretty challenging, but uh, a real collaboration. The uh, the production designer and uh, yeah, the directors were were great. And was this the kind of show on why I want to Earp where like, I love, I really loved this frame here of just the mixed tones and the temperature and the texture that you've got. Is this something, cause you had mentioned on Van Helsing running in with a lot and working in that space and not necessarily having a DIT on the show with you. Was this something that, you know, did you work with this mm-hmm. with your DIT on set on this show or were you pushing this and pulling this later in post in, uh, in your no. color timing? This this was the, this was also this was no no uh, this was just LUTs that I had. Mm. I built a few LUTs at the beginning of the show, and that was that was it. I didn't have a DMT on this one either. Gotcha. Very cool. So I liked. Uh, I mean, it's more like uh, try and find the nice uh, mm-hmm. nice combination. Now, do you storyboard these shows out with your director and with the team before this, or is it? You know, I've talked to different people and everybody has a different approach. Some people walk in and they're like, I want to feel the moment. I want to feel the scene. But how how do you like to work in a show, especially a show like this with so much action in, into it? They be broken down and, and uh, there's a lot of parts to it. Then they would storyboard it and uh, you just have it there as a hire a storyboard artist and at least get all the beats that they know they'll need to have on the scene. So I think uh, I don't. I wouldn't be involved in getting a. Uh, uh, and the director would have it, but by a station, and then we could look at it and go, we still need this shot. We need that shot, and usually the directors are crossing them off. Mm-hmm. So I think I would say it's a director's uh, uh, format because mm-hmm. it's uh, and editors too. I don't know if the editors. Uh, chirp in there too but I'm not sure if they uh, are a part of it right I just usually see them when they show up on set or uh, at the production meeting and it's usually on a sequence where they have to get all the pieces mm-hmm. right or the, the the pieces that they would love love to get mm-hmm. let's move into I want to talk to you so about... I think it's uh, yeah I think it's different on every show mm-hmm. 
let's say I want to move into kind of our last topic of conversation about your process. You know, what, what has, what has been something that has worked for you as you found over the years of, you know, from taking notes to how do you scout and what are some of the things that you do? You know, what are some of the, what can you share with the people? What has been kind of your plethora of the tools that you like to use? Like you got it in your position is script. It's just script is there to make you. And then you, you've got to be, but you get your ideas across. But I think, uh, pre-visualization, you just have to contrast your like how you want to, how you want to see it. I don't think you can rely too much on technology because in the end it's your, you've got to see it through your eyes. Reading a lot helps reading a lot of scripts and start seeing how the blocking is going to start to happen. Like if you can see, I mean, the blocking's kind of written a lot of times on a scene, but it's not in stone, right? I mean, sometimes it doesn't work and where they stand and who's, you know, it's, you've got to use your, uh, just things that have worked for you in the past, basically. Sure. What are some of the tools that you, you like to use when you're working in your, in your, uh, in your scouting process? Like what are you using? You know, what are you using to, to get yourself prepared for a show? Um, well, you're just getting, read the scripts a lot. And uh, when you go to locations, you're trying to s- remember that scene and see where, how many people are in it, where they're coming from, where the light is, where the sun is, all those things that are going to affect you on the day. And uh, you just have to be prepared for anything when uh, the day isn't how you would like it to be. You just got to have uh, some tricks that you can you pull out and have the, t- the equipment there that you can actually fix. So that's really all the things you have to find out on the scout to make sure that uh, you're not going to have too many surprises when you get there on location to shoot it. Sure. Makes a lot of sense. <laughs> um, what's one of the... What's one of the th- yeah? Right? It's pretty. It's it's common sense. Yeah. What's one of the ways that you get into approaching comedy that maybe has be kind of become your own or something? Not necessarily become your own, but become a process that you've seen that's worked really well with being able to allow yourself to capture what's needed, where you're not getting hung up on certain things. And and then, in contrast to that, from a dramatic standpoint, is there anything different in your approach versus comedy versus drama? Or is it kind of the same at this point? Um, I think they're the same at this point. I mean, it's uh, it's how you approach the scene when you could be a great shot. All that stuff matters, but in the end, it's like you've got to. You're just there to make sure it looks great, as great as you can make it. And like you're collaborating with the director and the showrunner because it's their baby. So I mean, the directors are coming in like they're mostly just doing one episode or two episodes. But they're they're coming in prepped and uh, they have their ideas about how the show should happen. So I think just a, a director starts and you just finish with one the day before. So it's really great if you can manage to meet the director beforehand, just one on one and just have a sit down and talk about their approach to how you want to do it so that you can collaborate on that before you get to set in terms of like what they like to do and what they want to see. They want to start off with a big wide shot and then go directly into coverage or do they want to, it's just little things that some directors or DPs might prefer and the actors would appreciate. And uh, I think you just go from there and uh, because if you don't, like you don't have, uh, you don't have somebody on your side. Like sometimes, like what I've found, the directors don't sit at the monitors all the time because there's too much, to, like, you know, there might be too many people there or they like to be more on set with the actors really close so they don't want to run back and forth to the dead tent. It might be, you know, a five-second walk or a ten- or a five-minute walk. It could be, like, just too much. So you've got to make a connection with your director. I think that's the important thing for a DP. You've got to, you know, help them get what they want and they've got to help you get what you want so that you can get it done in time. So I think that's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a team, it's teamwork. Of course. I was going to ask you that it seems like 
for some of the different shows, different projects, you've had some long relationships, some long lasting relationships that have been around for maybe all the way back to being at university. I assumed just because you had mentioned uh, some stuff about Ryerson at that point of working with a mm-hmm. producer from Ryerson. You know, I think this plays into the idea of you talking yeah. about building relationship with your director on set, but how important it is to build those relationships throughout your career. You know, how has that been a big part of your success for you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I don't know. I think everybody's different. I mean, I'm not as out there on the internet and uh, life. So I think it's good to build relationships for sure. But uh, they change all the time. And uh, that's what I was going to say about a, from my career. It's like it's, it's, a, it's as much about survival as it is about getting a break or, you know, having a career. It's like you know, even people that have had great careers, it's about survival. It's uh, things change all the time. You know, you might be you might be the fashion or this, the flavor of the month uh, one month, and then you might have to go out and reinvent yourself, um, especially in commercials, I guess. I didn't uh, work get into commercials very much, but I know it was like that for music videos. And, you know, it's just uh, keeping yourself uh, current, I guess be up on all the latest gear and uh, the, the latest things to make things go quicker or cooler or, you know, any shot that is made that's even cooler than one you did before. Right. But I think you have to keep all that stuff in line with you're still trying to tell a story that you're hired for to help uh, visually tell the story. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, anybody that wants to get into film nowadays, I think it's just you have to have a tough skin. Like you can't uh, get hurt if somebody says they didn't like your lighting or, uh, you know, if uh, they don't want you to do a certain thing that way. It's like you just got to be, I mean, you could fight for your, you know, uh, ideas. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think, uh, I think you just have to keep in mind all these new technologies and everything and still tell the story and be consistent with uh, that approach when you're doing drama, I think. And well, comedy is more scripted, I think, but uh, and not, not not necessarily either. That's uh, there's other comedians that don't uh, want to script everything. Right, right. A lot of it's improv. So, but I mean, I'm just repeating myself, going in circles here. <laughs> no, it's all great. This is all great. Um, share with me. I, I'd love to hear how. You don't have to be. You don't have to be specific. But has there been a moment? in your career where there's been some challenges that you've had to fight through to overcome that has only made you stronger. Obviously I think everybody has faced this, but I think it's always great to hear people who are doing things at a high level Mm -hmm. to hear that like, Oh, there was this one time and this is how I got through it. And this is how years later it ultimately served me in a much better way. Is there something like that? That's kind of you've carried along with you as a, it's become a, a, a trophy to carry on at this point. Uh, no, I think more that happens just keep fit when you get a, a really tough day and you actually got really good stuff in the amount of time that you had to work. That's reward right there. That's the reward you get at the end of the day that you you left knowing that you've got some good shots and the good scenes and you did it in time and uh, you didn't go over budget. I mean, unless you're on a bigger show, but even even on bigger shows now, they don't want to do more than 14 hour days. And so I think those I'm, I'm not sure I, I, I don't uh, know what other shows do. Except uh, the ones I've been working on lately, they haven't been like more than four, you know, once in a while, a 14, 15 hour day. But for the most part, they're all 13 hour days, 12 hours plus lunch or in Vancouver, it's half an hour lunch. So. Mm. Gotcha. So 11 and a half hours. Gotcha. What's the last, I want to leave, we'll, we'll. Come back. But I think for, for students, it, yeah. Mm-hmm. No, go ahead. Okay. No, I think just for the, 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 the thick skin part of it, it's like, it's, uh, some people get lucky and they, they'll get a job and it'll be lead to the next job, next job, next job. And then other times you might get a, a job and then the show gets canceled and then all of a sudden you're not working. So I think it's uh, just having a, a thick skin, not giving up, and uh, surviving. Because in order to survive, you have to be there and you have to uh, be ready if you get another chance. So 
I think survival is the key word I'd say for a career in film nowadays. Mm -hmm. Unless you have like a super great connection and you fall into a super great job and it goes for 10 years and then, uh, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's not easy for everybody. Right. It's hard for everybody in film. Right. I mean, even, even people that have great success. I mean, I'll, I'll bet you Roger Deakins, I'll bet you Roger Deakins doesn't even get, uh, calls up like all the time. Sometimes he probably doesn't even have a, have a call coming in. I, Honestly, I, and I think, well, I don't think we could get him, you know, and that can become a, a problem in a sense, you know? Exactly. Yeah. 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 So there's always a weird yeah. middle ground that you're trying. Or, to or you might not be able to. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. What's the last, I'm going to give you the last word in the show. I but I think, say, uh, I was going to give you the last word in the show of what you can, what do you want to leave this audience um, with of these people that they can take home with them to, to improve, improve their skills, especially if we're all home right now. we got time. Yeah. Well, I think like the, the, it's pre, the pre visualization, I think is the most important thing for a filmmaker. And, uh, I think that's something you can work on. Just read a book and try and, see it in your head. I think uh, I learned that from Mark Andrichuk, this, uh, this director from uh, Hungary who came to Canada and was a teacher at Ryerson. And he said that same thing. That's where I heard it. That if you can't pre-visualize something, it's going to be really hard to light it because you haven't got an idea in your head to get to. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that's a big part of it when you get to the set is having the, the reality of the place that you're looking and then go back in your head to what you pre-visualize that scene and then see if there's any similarities that you can work with. Like maybe, maybe the windows are on the wrong side, so you're going to have to change it over. Maybe there's no way you can put lights up on the ceiling. Maybe there's no grid on the ceiling. So all those, the pre-visualization helps because at least you can come there with something. Whereas if you come into it with like nothing, it's a lot harder because then you're going to get all these, um, uh, things that aren't going to, they're going to be roadblocks. And I think you need that pre-visualized idea that you had to start somewhere. Like it'll give you, uh, it'll keep you grounded when you're looking on set and everybody's talking about where the scene's going to happen, how you're going to block it, but you've already got an idea. So you could just change your idea as other people start to bring in their ideas, but at least you're not coming there like blind, mm -hmm. basically. If you, if, you go, if you go there and you're just like everybody else, you're just blind. But it's your job to sort of bring a visual s style or a sense to that scene. So you've got something if they ask you. What do you think? It's like, oh, I think uh, she should come in that door. Well, why? Well, it's because you pre-visualized it and you realized that the whole scene will play now with a nice side light in the windows. Whereas if uh, you didn't change that and they brought her in from the other side, the other actor from the other side, all of a sudden you've got flat lighting for the whole scene. And then you just, because you didn't bring that in at the beginning, you're like, oh shit, now I gotta, now I'm in trouble. Because you didn't, uh, you know, bring your idea and test it with the, the new ideas coming in with the director and the showrunner or actors, whoever is at the blocking. Because mm -hmm. it has to feel right for everybody. It's, uh, it's, it's a moment where, it, it, if that's the real, when you're blocking, I think that is the, the moment where your ideas can come out freely and nobody's afraid to hear stuff. It's like, unless you're working with a director who's 100% sure this is how we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. And that's fine too. It's uh, just a matter of, then you got to sort of go, yeah, but what if we kind of had her come in that door instead? Because the lighting's going to be a lot nicer on her. Right, right. So I think that's where pre-visualization is kind of your insurance because it'll give you some confidence where you're kind of just guessing. And it's something you can drop at the, at the drop of a hat. If somebody has their ID, you can go, okay, that's better. Let's, let's move on. Let's get lit. <laughs> I like that. So I'd say that's my, uh, I didn't know that's what I was going to say. But pre-visualization is important anyways for anybody anybody who wants to write, direct, DP, edit, everything. I think it just helps uh, your brain work in the, that, that way. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, you'll never regret having that. Sure. 
Well, I think that's the perfect way to end the show. I think that's some of the best advice I think w- that we've received at this point on this show for everyone. So Gerald, I, I really appreciate you taking this time to share your experience and your work with everyone watching. Um, hope to, hope to see some of your, hope to see uh, the show that you just finished the, the 100 very soon. Oh yeah. The, the, the 100 is uh, season or season seven. Episode two is showing tonight at eight o'clock on uh, the CW network. Okay, great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again, Gerald. It was appreciated. Yeah, so you I want to check that out. It's, uh, it's a good episode. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Oh, well, thank you very much, David. Pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to meet you. Take care. Okay, take care. All right. Well, before we go, everybody, I'm muted. <laughs> Say goodbye to Gerald. Well, before we finish up the show here, um, we, we started doing some contests last week, which not a lot of people entered. So the people that did enter, you guys won. We had two entries. There were two prizes. We had two winners. So it's good. Um, technically, we had three. So the advan- the back a couple shows ago, we were talking to director Jordan Brady, and Paul Whitcomb was the only one that entered uh, the contest of by tagging. Uh, basically, what we had asked was everybody tag the Hurlbut Academy and my Instagram, David C. Weldon Jr., both on Instagram to tag something that you had learned over the course of this time being at home. And so that prize was getting the advanced commercial directing uh, course from the Hobbit Academy. That was That's going to Paul Whitcomb, who's been watching out in the United Kingdom. I don't think Paul's watching right now, though, because usually he's pretty vocal in the chat. So, Paul, I hope you're watching, and maybe you're just, you know, maybe you're watching on your couch or something. So last week's winners, we had the Roscoe Mix Book, which I bought this one. Roscoe did not give this to me. I bought this. This is a cool little device. But they, I reached out to them. They said they were willing to give away uh, one on the show. And Manuel Ray Garcia. It's going to you, buddy. Thanks for entering the contest. And then we had a piece of Hurlbut Academy content, which I don't have in front of me of which what the content was, but I'll make sure that I work it out with Shane and Lydia Hurlbut. Um, but Nickel, um, I totally bought I'm going to botch your name. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> Nikolai Farm uh, F A M K O L K A R. I'm sorry, my friend. <laughs> I'm terrible with names. But you are the winner from last week's show. So this week we have a new contest, and here's here's how it's going to work. The contest is going to be: you have to post something that you've been working on during this time where we've all been at home and we've all been trying to educate ourselves. Whether you're working on or where you've learned something, just Post something that you can share. And we're going to just kind of, you know, there's really no, there's no one way it's going to be better or the other. It's just post it to, uh, t- make sure you post it on Instagram and tag it on to the Hurlbut Academy and at my Instagram so we both can see it. That way myself and Shane and Lydia and the Hurlbut team, we can all work out who the winners are going to be. We hope we get more than two entries. This week we're going to be giving away a piece of, of Hurlbut Academy um, content called Recreating the Sun. And basically, Shane Hurlbut ASC talks about all the different ways that he's recreated shooting the sun from commercial work, from shooting feature film and television series, doing lighting for dusk, lighting for, you know, just where it goes away, all that kind of stuff. Um, This is going to be the piece of content that we're going to go through. My Instagram is, hold on, I'll wait till this video finishes just so you guys can get a sense of everything he teaches. It's, it's kind of intense. I was a part of a lot of this stuff that he was teaching. So it's really cool. My Instagram is David C. Weldon Jr. And I'll post this within the comments and the groups and all that kind of stuff. So you have it. And then I don't have a graphic for the Hurlbut Academy, but it's H U R L or H U R L B U T Academy at Hurlbut Academy and tag the both of us to enter the contest. So that pretty much does it for this week's show. Well, today's show, not this week. We have another show coming up on Friday. Friday is director Alex Buono. Many of you may have met him before, uh, seen his work on places like Saturday Night Live where he was the SNL's film unit DP for a number of years. Now he's moved on to directing. He uh, has done a show with Hulu with Seth Rogen that's currently airing uh, called Future Man. We're going to talk about that process, that show. We're going to talk about his work with Documentary Now. Um, with Bill Hader and Fred Armisen. 
We're going to talk about his commercial work. He's a great guy. He's a great um, great educator. He's done all kinds of different stuff um, teaching online as well. So be sure to tune in on Friday, 12 o'clock, noon, Pacific time. Calculate that to wherever you live, 3 o'clock Eastern. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Gerald. Really appreciate your time. Appreciate you everybody's time for checking this show out, this little thing that we're doing here. Take care. See you guys Friday, noon. Bye.